quiet and uh, hard this evening. Thank you that we can, with humility, come to your word to be instructed by you, Holy Spirit. Thank you that you are the author of every word on these pages. And so what a privilege it is to know the author of this book. Lord, we all want to get to know you more. That's why we have tonight. But thank you for this privilege. We thank you that this word that we're going to touch on this week or this evening, this book called the Bible, we're going to learn about, has come to us in a miraculous way. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for bringing this book to us today. Not just for the sake of having a book, but because it transforms lives, transforms our life on a daily basis if we will humbly come to it and be taught by you through your word. Be with us, Lord, keep us focused on this. May we learn tonight so that when we meet those that will be disheartening in the future, things that we learn tonight will be. Uh, brought back to our memory for the right time as we minister and disciple those that you bring across our path to us, or that we intentionally go out to find. So thank you, Lord, be on my lips, Lord. Thank you that I can share this evening's talk, teaching, exposition with Neil Lord, who's also going to bring some amazing insights and also the weather in particular. Thank you that we can do this together in a team because it's always better when your sons and daughters come together in unity. And that's what we trust in this whole time of Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So friends, we've got to Slice number F12. How's that? Ferrari number 12. <laughs> Welcome back. Great to see everyone here. Um, I would like to know how your week has been. How did last week's teaching around serving play out in your walk with the Lord this week? Has anybody got a testimony? I know I'm putting you on the spot here. That word serving comes through the Bible many times. Jesus is the servant leader of all, as I example. Anybody got a uh, testimony of serving in the last week? It was a trip for me. I made toast to salmon on Sunday. Then I had a little tea and lunch. And to see the band drink. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you, Vicky. Anybody else? All right. Um, who can remember last week's memory verse? <coughs> Joseph. Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Last week's survey memory verse. Mark 10, 45. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Yes. That's correct. And who can remember the words of Mark 10, 45? Joseph, that can you? Mm. Elsa's got it. Elsa. Elsa. Um, this is what he said. <laughs> For then, um, the Son of Man um, came not to be served, but to serve and to give life um, as a ransom? As a ransom to too many. Amen. And there's no cribbing here. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even ever follow. But exactly. Teaching me inside of oh, you. Yeah. So that second part is so important. Yeah. Thank you. 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 To give his life as a ransom for many. for many. And we are the many. Thank you, Lord, for giving it. Yes. Rhonda. Yeah. 
here last week, I have we got the, the, the transcripts and recording of the Yes, we do. Oh. Are you sure it does? Yes. Oh, We've got the transcript and recording of everyone, haven't we? No, not that one. Though. I have it, All whether it's on YouTube. Just, we, it's yeah, it's, it's definitely we've got it. But whether <laughs> you can access it is another story. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't uh, the I know. <laughs> That's why I could boldly answer, not knowing. See, I can't catch up unless I've got that. Sorry, my dear. Oh. Thank you, Here's your love. Yeah, here's your love. <laughs> you need to send Robbie flowers <laughs> and chocolates. <laughs> so Just he left, send him a chocolate bowl. Is not up yet. Just send him a chocolate bowl with the words F11 on it from Rhonda. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just keep an eye out for it, Rhonda. It'll be up soon. I did, I did keep an eye out. <laughs> Robbie promised. I think so, eh? There's a little bit of processing that goes into taking it from a team oh, recording no, I into... No, I'm sorry to no, 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 it's fine. That's why I can't, couldn't catch up. Sorry. All right. Thank you. Thank Excuses, everybody. Excuses just for me. Yeah. Holding this problem. This challenge. All right, let's go on to this evening. Um, as I said, we're going to be sharing the teaching. So Luella is going to start with today's memory verse. If you have a look at the slide content, contents, um, Luella will be num number two as well. They will share number three and number four and number five. And Neil will be sharing number six. Luella, seven through nine, and Dave will land this awesome aeroplane. Luella, over to you. Okay. Right, so let's take a look at the memory verse. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. This is one of my favorite uh, verses uh, of all time. Amen. All scripture is God breathing and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the man or the woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Friends, this scripture, you can, you can stress each word and say it however many words are in there that many times, and it will have a whole brand new meaning in your life. You know, and so for me, maybe one of the things that we can just pick up is what does it mean? to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Does anybody want to say what that actually means? You don't need a blueprint for how every encounter will work out because uh, you, God will just show up and the Holy Spirit will remind us of scripture and relevancy at the point in time. Uh, so. He's faithful and just to always do that for us. And another time when Jesus breathed, he breathed on his disciples. Mm. You know. And, you know, for me, God breathed. Mm. What does that actually mean? And uh, I, th I think we're going to go through it now and, and actually discover that as we go. But just keep that thought in your mind. God breathed. Number two, the Bible. The word Bible comes from the Latin and Greek word for book, Biblia or Biblia. The Bible is actually not a book. It is a library of 66 books written by 40 different authors from a variety of educational and cultural backgrounds. These books were written over a time period of approximately 1,600 years. Yet the Bible remains totally consistent in its message. Friends, I, I, I look at it like this. 1600, 40, 3, 1. Okay, 1600 years, 40 authors, 3 languages, but 1 key. It remains consistent in its message. God and his dealing with mankind. The Bible is both the first book ever written and the greatest book ever written. It contains the answers to the most important questions of life. Who am I? Why am I here? Where 
am I going? And what is that all about? The Bible has been called the Book of Life, and it reveals the Messiah, the Lord and Savior, Jesus. Some people may become despondent and discouraged, perceiving that the Bible is a bit complex and difficult to read and understand. There are three major ways to assist us in understanding the Bible. Let's have a look at this. First bullet point. God gave us the Holy Spirit to assist us in growing closer to Him. The Holy Spirit illuminates Scripture. On this point, I want to share with you one of the most incredible quotes from Tyre and Daniel. And this is what he said. The Bible is the only book in the whole world where the author is always present when you read it. You know, it's, it's amazing. I think Dave brought this up the other day. Is if you have a, a book on, on tape or CD, an audio book, where the actual author of the book reads his own book, it's incredible to listen to that. But friends, here we have the Holy Spirit is always with us when we are reading Scripture. And he will never not be with us. Amazing. So we have the Holy Spirit who illuminates scriptures and helps us to understand them as we persevere in faith, reading the manufacturer's handbook. Second bullet point, there are study Bibles available which help the reader put the books of the Bible in context and explain the writings of the author. It's so helpful to have that thing because none of us are an expert in, in, in these fields. But there are those who have taken the time and study and then they bless us with, with their content. Thirdly, attending church services, Bible studies and home groups where the Word of God is taught and explained. Now the inspiration of Scripture. The term fundamentalist was derived to describe the Christian who upholds the belief that the Bible is infallible and inerrant. Inerrant means there are no errors, and infallible means there can be no errors. Church on the Way believes the Bible has been inspired by the Holy Spirit as described by Paul. And again, we read our, our verse of the day, our memory verse, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is god breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. The word inspired here literally means God breathed. This implies that the Holy Spirit inspired the authors of the books of the Bible to record God's message accurately, but in the writer's own words. The inspirational work of the Holy Spirit can be seen in the book of Exodus, where the Holy Spirit guided the craftsmanship of Bezalel and Oliab, the builders of the tabernacle. The Apostle Peter writes on the inspirational work of the Holy Spirit, explaining in 2 Peter 1, 20-21, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. The prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets through humans, through humans spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. I would like to interrupt you if I may. Friends, the scripture, the memory scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16. I know each word can jump out at us and have as much meaning as the next. I thought we should just touch on the, the words rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Those concepts are sometimes interpreted as being lording it over somebody and almost um, being um, seeing yourself as more valuable than other people. You know, rebuking. That word rebuke. Does anybody know what that means? I don't like it. What does it mean? Tell him off. Is it? No, rebuke. Stop that. I'm telling you no. So which which scripture would you use for rebuking? And to whom would you use that? 
Oh yes, when he cleared out the temple. Yeah, yeah. He yes. Them, and also you rebuke the the um sorry the, you you rebuke Satan when he. Ah, oh, isn't that so well, well remembered? I'd forgotten that. Yes. Sure. He rebuked um, the wings of the disciples for lack of faith. Okay. He so Nature also. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> what do you think, sir? Yeah, I think rebuke also apply more for people who know the truth. Like uh, what's it like? New Galatians. You are yes, supposed to be oh. this that you did in life. Yes. So you can not rebuke people who don't know the truth, but you can rebuke the person who knows but don't follow. Great one. That seems a bit like a, a rule, though. <laughs> so so my, my thought here is, and this is what I wanted to uh, just leave with us. Remember, the purpose of this whole discipleship course is to bring people through. And I know in the world, um, people <coughs> resist each other. And in the world, somebody else says, what right do you have to rebuke me? Yet, it's not us. It's in context, rebuking is right. In context of the, the Apostle Paul talking to his disciples who should know better. Jesus talking to the Pharisees who should have known better. Um, so, uh, just a comment, you know, yeah. and I'm sure we'll get into the translation, but you've got to get back to the original Greek. Okay. You can't take the English word. Yeah. And so if you look at the ESV, even use, it doesn't use rebuke, it uses reproof, okay. which is refuting error. So it's a bit different to rebuke. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's looking at error and saying, no, you're on the wrong course. But yeah. so that's why the next word is so important in that, is correcting. Mm. So you need to be able to stop that and say, here is the accurate yeah. interpretation. Yeah. And then it goes on to say training. So we learn a lesson from these hard truths and together we correct and then learn. So I think it's amazing if you look at it like that. Like the School of Christ. <coughs> the dictionary links uh, uh, the word reproof, reprimand, stern disappro disapproval. So it's 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 not just a gentle. I don't think it's a good idea. It's it's an absolute. But I think linked to what and Neil said, with, the uh, correction comes quality. following that. Yes, very good. I think also we need to remember this: that this, this scripture is useful for teaching. It's not you or me. Yes. It's yeah. all scripture. In other words, when I read the Bible and I see that my life's not lining up with it. That scripture might rebuke them. Yeah. It might correct mm. you. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's the scripture. It's not the person. I think it's uh, very important that you highlight that, Luella, yeah. because there's so much, I've been watching the news in the last two days, there's so much going on with this nonsense with LGBTQ and seeing cases where they're actually, people are coming under attack for bringing the gospel or whatever, but actually it's the word of God that is rebuking them, not the person. They're attacking the person, but it's the word of God that's doing the rebuking. Thank you. Okay, so let's, we we're about the middle of the page. The 66 books of the Bible are filled with guidance and instruction from God written in numerous ways. And this is very important to realize. We have to understand the context of what you read. So there are narratives or stories of the lives of men and women discussing behaviors that should both be emulated and avoided. Then we have history, which reveals God's hand on world events. We read about covenants and legal documents. We read songs and poetry containing messages from God, guiding and correcting his people. We have prophecy revealing God's foreknowledge, his control over future events, and the correction of his people, and many varieties of teaching for the development of, it, of the individual. We must be mindful of the fact that because the Bible is inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
It is an authoritative book, giving us the moral foundations upon which we can stand. The Bible speaks with God's authority to direct our faith and lives in every area of <coughs> The human world rejects God's word and establishes man-made laws and rules to follow. Rules that are arbitrary and change with the development of new philosophies. Their moral laws have no firm foundation and change according to the desires of the people. In other words, friends, God's word never changes. And this is something we we can rely upon. But depending on what philosophy is going on in the world at the time, laws and rules change. And it really is like building your life on sinking sand. It? <coughs> it is not a law book, but a love book. Some Christians become legalistic mm. and live by a long list of do's and don'ts. They become modern day Pharisees. These legalistic Christians forget the two most important commandments that were covered in Christ's heart. Who knows what they are without cheating? Yeah. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and as your neighbor, and as your neighbor, and as yourself. When a believer is yoked to Jesus, these two laws become a joy and not a burden. Matthew 11, 28 to 30 means as follows. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The Bible is a love gift to mankind, giving guidance to enable believers to have a close relationship with a holy and mighty God. Just if we didn't have the Bible, we would not know how to live our life. We would not know how to get closer into an intimate relationship with Him. We need this book. We need this inspiration. And it is a gift. Amen. Thank you. Again, I want to remind us why we do this. We, we, we would like our disciples to fall in love with this word. That's one of the goals of being a good teacher is for the disciple to then go further than us with what they've been received or they have received. So think of that as we continue. Why should we read the Bible? Anybody got an answer? Nobody being put on the spot here, David. No, God. Pardon? To know God. <coughs> if it's his word revealed to us, yes, surely that's a very good point. <coughs> you know, God, David, what do you think? Why should we... Instructions for life. I mean, all aspects of life. Yes, that's right. Eh? Anybody else want to share with us a revelation you might have of why we should read the Bible? For relationship, for encouragement, Understanding. Yes. Isn't that true? Each one of those is so right. Um, those words of life and supernatural. Amen. How will you know God if you don't truly hear? Yes. And the beauty of it, it's still relevant. Mm. Yeah. It's living. It will always be relevant. Yes. Yeah. And to know our, our own identity. <laughs> Correct. Whose we are? And they give purpose to life. Thank you. And, and so that we may be thoroughly equipped for every good life. Say. <laughs> hey, that's what we're giving to. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that. Well, well, that can be. <laughs> well. Very well. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, we've touched on the scripture three, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. <laughs> now we go to 17. So that the servant of God, that's us, May be thoroughly equipped for every good work. This isn't work for your salvation. It's a servant of God who have already bowed our knees to Jesus Christ. Getting equipped over time. It's a journey. 
and it's a journey of great discovery. Not for ourselves, so that we can impart this to others. And I believe those are the works that they're talking about here. Spending time with people can be challenging. Sometimes it takes hard work. We're going to find that in our students, our disciples, our friends, and our early and younger believers. Those that are just coming into a relationship with the Lord might frustrate us, but let's be equipped so that we can work through it with patience, yet with confidence. The Apostle Paul, in his second letter to Timothy, emphasized the importance of reading the Bible. And here are five reasons. Teaching, it's a manufacturer's handbook, as we we read earlier. It's given to us by the loving God to guide us in all things. Wow, Lord, thank you. All things that we don't even know about are there for us because He guides us. Not because we know enough to do it, as we share our testimony with others, as we witness, as we pray for these names on our list that uh, we prayed for earlier, and, and the Lord, by His Spirit, placed on our hearts. Um, it's God that guides us, because He loves us, and He loves those that we're working with. Jesus is the Word of God, capital W. I'm not sure if your Chichewe Bible has capital W, Joseph. Please have a look there for us so long. Um, it's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. <laughs> no, I'm only joking. Yeah? <laughs> the Word of God. <laughs> okay. John 8, 31 to 32. To the Jews who had believed. Remember, we, we uh, learned this one earlier. To the Jews who had believed, Jesus said, If you hold to my teachings, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Set you free. What a liberating <coughs> scripture. The next word is what Mark introduced to us, reproof. Some of the um, scriptures we read said rebuke. But reproof is when um, he communicates with us through his word, and the most important part of that communication is when God guides us to scriptures, and highlight an area of our own lives that need correction. And that's the message I think we must impart on our disciples and those that we're working with. It's not us. They will discover what the scriptures highlight in their own minds and in their own hearts and in their own lives when they fall in love with the word and start reading it, reading it more and more. God reproves us through his word and molds us into the image of his son. The author of Hebrews says, the word of God is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit. Sure. Joints and marrow. He judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the word of God does this. Not David. I'm not there to judge um, the person's heart that we're working with or that I'm discipling. Uh, it's the Spirit of God living and active in the Word that is this shop. Training in righteousness is another essential component which we had touched on a little bit earlier. Um, there's so much to learn from these individuals in how they related to God and the consequences of the actions. So, all these numerous narratives in the scripture explain uh, people's stories, people's story of those who have encountered God, and um, we can learn from them, both their successes and their failures. There's so many Bible characters. Um, there's, a, there's a book called um, so it's about each person in the Bible. Who is this? I think it's called. And it's every name that appears in the Bible. And to go and see who this person was, that 
the, the, the writer of that book elaborated on each person as they appear in scripture. And there are lots of people, lots of different characters of every walk in life. So have a look at these Bible characters. All right, we're moving on to maturing as we continue to reread the Bible. Reread. That's not a typo. As we continue to reread the Bible, we grow in understanding of God's Word and we start to mature in our relationship with Him. That's what we want. It's a sign of maturity. We get inspiration. Number five, no matter how many times you or I read the Bible, the Holy Spirit is always illuminating new facets of Scripture that will leave us each in awe and wonder at the greatness of God. It's the Holy Spirit who inspires, inspires the Scriptures, so it is the Holy Spirit who also illuminates them for us, as we will have said earlier too. So continue to read your Bible and continue to be amazed. Excellent. Has anybody quickly got a testimony of being amazed? That word amazed isn't used often, but Jesus was once amazed. Scriptures that have amazed you? Oh, come on, give us one. Well, the, the simplest one I think we can all testify to is, He'll never leave us nor forsake us. So whenever you're down and you turn, he's always there. And, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, which we all want. Thank you, Robbie. So those two are just like power. Yeah. Thank you. All right, the Old Testament. Lou mentioned earlier what the Bible is uh, made up of, all these different books, the two distinct testaments, old and new. 39 books in the old. There are divisions, prophets, books are on the law, books on psalms and encouragement. Um, this word, Tanakh, is an acronym for those letters in Hebrew. Of Torah, Nevim, and Ketubim. Excuse my pronunciation. I'm not sure if anybody went and followed that link that I sent to on uh, our discipleship group. I just sent it. Eh? Isn't that amazing? And that, that, that guy focused quite a bit on this. So I'm not going to dwell there because we do need to move on. Um, but this is it. The Old Testament represents, or sorry, presents great truths about God and about humanity. It sets a background for the New Testament. It reveals God's covenant promises, the formation of the nation of Israel, and the blessing that will extend from that nation to all nations of the earth. It holds the foundation for biblical prophecies, several of which are being fulfilled even right now in our time, and are yet to be fulfilled in the future. And it presents spiritual truths and lessons that apply to each and every one of us today as well. That's the Old Testament. The New Testament, 27 books, four Gospels, and these Gospels are amazing. These are amazing books in themselves. Eyewitness accounts of Jesus walking the earth. I'm not going to read all of those. I think it's easy to read um, in our own time. So the book of Acts, I love Acts. I really love, love, love Acts. We, I introduced us to Acts a few weeks ago on a Sunday morning. And it should be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit, there's no doubt about that. Paul wrote these amazing letters inspired by the Holy Spirit in order to establish the church and launch the church out into the world. And that's why we are here today in the bottom end of Africa, because Paul wrote letters of love to the believers that received them, heard the word of God, and went out. So, yes, I'd like to move on now. Uh, the general letters. Can I just say something quickly before yes, you move do? What I find amazing about the beginning of the New Testament, firstly, is that the eyewitness accounts in the gospel. Yes. And then we've got the book of Luke. And Luke wrote an account 
He was a historian and a medical doctor. He was a man who wanted things to be accurate. And he went about getting accurate eyewitness accounts. Not only from the disciples who wrote something, but from the women. You know, from, from little characters that, that may have been around Jesus. And, you know, John writes in his gospel that if all the things were written down, we would never have enough time to actually put it into a book or to read it. So that for me is amazing. Um, the other thing is that in some of the general letters, we have people like James, who was Jesus' own brother. Yes, you know, he was a man who, while Jesus was in the beginning of his ministry time, actually was crossed with Jesus. So what happened and what changed? And that's what makes these, these accounts so incredible. Thank you, Ruth. Very good perspective. Revelation. The book of Revelation is apocalyptic. Apocalyptic. Which means an unveiling of that which was previously hidden. Does anybody know what Proverbs 25 verse 2 says in your own words? Come on, Alpha. Proverbs 22. Uh, 25. 25. <laughs> Sorry? First letter. Um, <laughs> Sounds like. It. Sounds like. <laughs> okay. I'll just do a paraphrase here. It is the, the, the prerogative of God to conceal a matter. And it is the privilege of kings to discover a matter. And that's what it's saying here. Um, it, it was hidden. It was previously hidden. It contains pro uh, literal prophecies that record the tribulation and the return of Jesus to establish the king, his kingdom. This will be temporal, divine, eternal, and all-consuming. Neil, can I uh, hand over to you to talk about the various translations? You certainly may. Just a point on prophecy. We're we'll doing that next week. Very exciting. If you want to invite people to the lecture or tell people in church about, about them, encourage them to come, they're welcome. It's important to get a full understanding of that and where the church is going. What, uh, translation is just going to go through and explain the ta tables and how those tables and the Bibles are classified. So uh, just a few corrections. Just should be some commas between formal equipment, comma, functional equipment, comma, free. And then above the ta table there's been some tab, misalignments, literal. And then dynamic should be where paraphrased is, and paraphrased should move right to the end of the table on the right-hand side, side. So just put arrows there moving the, the, them across. Okay, so we're going to now look at, at the, the categories those Bibles fall in within the, the table. And the first one is the formal equivalence, which is down at the bottom of the page under the uh, key. So formal equivalence, it translates directly to remain close to the form, hence formal equivalence, the form of Hebrew and Greek are still attempting to write incomprehensible English, often described as literal translations. Some people will say word for word. I don't see that as being very accurate. Yako, he said to us in Afrikaans, he threw a stone at me. I remember the club was And then translate that directly word for word into English. He threw me with a stone. He threw me with a stone. See, it doesn't make any... Sense. So to, to say that these translators translated word for word isn't actually accurate, but it's, they're trying to get as close to uh, what they did, did to be as accurate as possible. Uh, Neil, there's also another element to that is the uh, emphasis in any word or any sentence. Because just using three words or a few words, the dog bit the man. What's the emphasis there? What about the dog with the man? The dog but the man. The dog but 
What we have to look at yeah, is uh, what you're getting there is that they're trying to get as close to the original meaning that the writer was trying to get across to his readers. Okay. Then uh, the functional equivalent is uh, the dynamic on the table worked to keep the meaning of the original Hebrew and Greek while translating the words and idioms into flowing English. So they would be more thoughtful thought. Okay, let me give you an example of, of uh, the concerns people have about those two different translations. So if you want to, you can, but I'll be reading from the Bible. Uh, Matthew, I'll be looking at Matthew 5. Rhonda, are you ready? Matthew, I'll read from the King James first. Matthew 5, 1 to 2. So this is King James, which is the literal or formal equivalent. And seeing the multitude, he went up into the mountain, and when he came, was seated, he, uh, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Okay, now read the NIV. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying... Right, so we have the first one being the literal, and the second one in life being paraphrased. Did anyone pick up the difference? He opened his mouth. Is missing from the NIV. Okay, now why they do that is he's teaching. So it's obvious he's opened his mouth. Yeah. Correct. <laughs> You see how it's thought for? Thought. But Matthew, now this is where we get deeper. It's like you're having a steak there, but here is the juicy steak in the King James. Matthew is writing to the Jews, and he's trying to get across the message that Jesus is God. And God speaks. What happened? Jesus is on a mount. This is the Sermon of the Mount. Where did the Jews have God speak to them? Mount Sinai. It connects to Mount Sinai. And God spoke creation. You see how that he opened his mouth has such a key for the Jewish people. And it's so important. Yet it's left out in the NIV because they're just getting a thoughtful thought across. Are you understanding now the difference between the, the two translations and how it's important to... Uh, Look at more than one translation. Neil, may I ask a question? Where does the Amplified sit in this? I am not absolutely sure on the Amplified. I can just hazard a guess as being between the dynamic and paraphrased. Uh, paraphrased. Uh, looking at three, which is over the page. The free will clarify scripture attempting to translate the scripture message from one language to another by using everyday words. The translation focuses on, on explaining the message and is less concerned with the exact words uh, used by the author. And that's why I don't recommend the free translation. And also, they tend to be written by single translators. What do you think is a problem with that? That is just one translator, not a group of translators translating it. What is the danger there? No opinion. Ah, exactly. They put their doctrinal interpretation into that translation. So it becomes bias. And let me just give you an example of uh, another two, two looking at Zechariah. Uh, for uh, 13.6 for those who are following 
So after 13, 6 says, And one shall say unto him, this is King James, What are those wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Now notice how important that is because Jesus is speaking here. And in those times, there was no wrist. You had arm and hand. So the fact that the nail went into the wrist was written as hand. Okay. So here it is pointing directly to the wounds in Jesus' hands. That seeing and saying, whoa, look at that. Now listen to the Living Bible, which is the, right at the end on the paraphrase on your table. And if someone asks, then what are those scars on your chest and your back? He will say, I got into a brawl at the home of a friend. And how does that match with Jesus' crucifixion? You see, it's totally lost. Okay, so the more you go into the free translations, the further you go away from interpreting Scripture accurately. All right, uh, let's carry on with the next paragraph then. The choice of a personal Bible to read it, uh, is a very personal one. It is best, however, to avoid the free translations. Although you may, uh, they may be easier to read, they may miss out on, on the depth and meaning held in the Scripture, uh, the correct wor word used for Scripture. Sorry. For example, a free translation may exchange torch for lamp. Uh, they actually, the Living Bible uses flashlight in uh, Psalm 119 and And what you're missing out then is that the lamps of the day had oil in it. What is the significance of oil in the Bible? Holy Spirit, correct. You see how they, they by making it more modern for the people to read and understand it, they're losing out on the significance of the message. Okay. So the explanation of a person not having batteries for their torch to light the way misses out on the crucial meaning of the scripture being that they do not have oil of the Holy Spirit in it. Okay. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 12, 4, Paul uh, is writing and uses the term charismata. Does anyone know what that means? We get the, the, the uh, group charismatics from it. So Paul was referring to? Correct. Absolutely. But the Living Bible will say special abilities. You see that, that message of the gift that you're getting from the Holy Spirit is being uh, lost. In these translations. Uh, when studying scripture, it's always important to look at different translations to see uh, each. Oh, sorry, before I go on that, that I want to go through NIV. Rhonda, we, we're up, up again. And I just want to go through comparisons between uh, the King James and NIV to bring home a message for you. The first one is. Uh, Matthew 17, if anyone's wanting to follow, and I'll read the scripture. 21, how be it this kind goeth out except by prayer and fasting? Wonder will you read that Matthew 17, 21 for us? That is because NIV leaves that scripture out. Yes. And I, we're just going through some of them. So let's turn to an, another one. Uh, it will be in your footnote. Matthew 17, 21. Not all of them have, but some of the NIV, NIV, NIVs will put it on the footnote. Howbeit this kind goes out, uh, not except by prayer and fasting. Remember Jesus cast out the demon. So he's saying that this demon to be cast out requires prayer and fasting. It's an important scripture. Okay. Yeah, uh, no. ESV and NIV 
are very similar on these scriptures, and that's why I'm coming. I'll be coming to that. I was hoping to introduce it a little slower than that. That, <laughs> but, but it's it's out there now. So we'll to see. Okay, Mark Mark eleven twenty six. Let me read uh, twenty six. But if ye do not forgive me, neither will your Father who is in heaven forgive you your trespasses. Rhonda, we're waiting. It's like 26. <laughs> you must write that. Okay, go to, go to the book of, of Luke. Yeah. Luke's, Luke 17, 36. Do we, which which one did you say was missing in the NIV? Okay, I'm burning yeah. yeah, but it's there. If you click on the sub notes, it'll give you um, verse seven. It says some manuscripts include here the words similar to Matthew. Yes. 15. Okay. No, your printed version will. You've got to write the, read the footnote and go to the. If you but the whole thing is unless you're aware of that, and if you read yeah. your foot, don't read your footnotes. You will go through and not read that scripture. But not every Bible has got the footnotes. If you go to the NLT, it's not there. Yeah. There's no reference to it. Being so there. we can carry on going. Do you want me to do a few more to, to see that? that? I think we must move on there. Okay, because it's getting uh, on the other. You can go through. There are quite a large no number. Okay, the question is why? And we'll do that when we get to the, the manuscript. Manuscript. Ah. Uh, when studying scripture, it is always important to look at different translations, see how each trans uh, translation translates the key words of the sentence being studied. In Hebrew, for example, there are root words such as rosh, which means head, or first. Now, the translator has to work out which one is the guy meaning, head or first. And in Hebrew, there, there's no such thing as either or. Sometimes you can have both and. But the writer has to choose one. So that's why it's important for, for us when we're studying a specific scripture to look at the actual wor words and interpret what those words mean. And uh, if you're, the wrong one's chosen, then the significance of that scripture can be lost to the reader. Right, to talk about the manus manuscripts now, now. The manuscripts can be broken into three different main groups. And these are the manuscripts these different translations use, and that's why I will explain why NIV has missing scriptures. What happened is the three areas are, are Roman, uh, Alexandria, and Byzantine. Now, Rome is corrupted by Catholicism. State. Let me give you an example of that from the Catholic Bible. Yeah. In Genesis 3, uh, 15, it's God speaking to the serpent says, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman and thy seed and her seed. Okay. She shall crush thy head. What should it say? He. he. So they put Mary as the one who crushes the serpent's head. head. And remember, the strike the heel is about the crucifixion. It goes on, and uh, and earth shall, I uh, uh, say, uh, uh, she shall crush thy head, and thou shalt lie and wait for her heel. So there's the battle between Mary and Satan in that. In that. So you, you can't trust the Roman manuscripts because they corrupted. And then the other is Alexandria. And in Alexandria you had the Alexandrian library and the test for knowledge and you had all these philosophers, Greek philosophers, so you had a contamination of syncretism in those manuscripts, in their translations. So what has hap happened when the, NI, the King James sat down? They got, got eight groups of four and 22,000 manuscripts. And they went through those eight and then brought them down to four groups and then two groups and then one group, continually going over all those manuscripts and refining it down. What the NIV ESV did, they said, let us look at the oldest manuscripts. The oldest will be the most accurate. But hold on, the oldest would be in the places where the Bible's not being used. Do you see the significance of that? 
in Byzantine area, which is uh, the home of Paul in Antioch and Jerusalem. They were reading their manuscripts. They were using them, and they were getting worn out. So the older, inaccurate ones are the ones that were used as being the accurate. And the manuscripts that were younger were uh, not as seen, they were ignored. So the NIV uses 8,000, not 22,000 manuscripts. Can you see the significance there? And that's why we have scriptures being left out. Okay, let me move on. I've taken kind of time there. Just something if you're looking at the, ta the table there. Okay, can you see the TLB? That's the Living Bible. That's the one I've been reading from for you. But looking at the other end on the literal, the King James Version is difficult to read because uh, it uses old Eng English. And you have the, who, uh, who told us thou that thou was naked? You know, it's got that about it. And in the other translations, you'll, you'll have God saying, but who told you you were naked? You see, there's a difference as yeah. what uh, David was implying, the em emphasis. So the, the New American Standard Bible and the New King James Bible ha have tried to get rid of that old English. Okay, but so those are the more accurate uh, translations. So why are we using, well, let me just re read the last bit and we'll answer the last que question. The re so the recommendation of Church in the Way is to purchase a good study Bible such as the ESV or the American, I didn't put the American Standard, I'll explain wh why. Uh, but the American, New American Standard Bible is an excellent study Bible as well. These Bibles will give explanations for scriptures and also give co context to the books you are reading. They, are, they also include maps, diagrams and tables which further help the reader understand the scriptures, and I have a small one, they come bigger than this, but just a small study by NIV study Bible, if anyone wants to have a look at, look at it. And then why, so why did we choose the NIV? It's, if you take a look at the ta table, it's right at the end of the, the literal, literal, your formal equivalent, so it is more accurate than the NIV, uh, but it still has scriptures missing. But the thing is, we're teaching new Christians. Many uh, could have trouble with English. To use one of the literal Bibles would be very, and be very <coughs> as you can see, as we've gone through, we've gone through the easier English of NIV and ESV for the, the, the memory of the scriptures. It's easier for them to remember the, that. But if you are dealing with someone who is more of a mature per person, you can recommend the New American Standard Study, Bi study Bible. Does that make sense of why we've uh, put forward the ESV? Okay. Thank Any you could... so much, Neil. Lou, sure. over to you. Okay, so in case you're all feeling totally depressed now and wondering, you know, if, if the Bible is any use at all, I just want to remind you who the author is. It's the Holy Spirit. And he, he is the one who, who reveals Scripture to us. So please... Friends, make use of the different translations. Make use of your footnotes if you have them. Um, I notice even the NLP has a footnote for all those missing verses. But make use of those things and study the word, like Neil said. Find out exactly what is meant there and, and make use of these different <coughs> translations which are available to all of us. Okay, I'll just make one further point there. Uh, the NRSD. Which is the new uh, new revised standard version is a politically correct, so it has gender neutral. Okay. So you have to when you're buying a Bible, be very careful and re research uh, it if you are doing that. that. Thank you. All right. So scripture memory. Let's talk about that. We're on number six. It's a new one. Okay. Scripture memory. It is important to note that Jesus memorized scripture. He probably did it as a young Jewish boy, and like many of them did. But Jesus, to strengthen his statements, would regularly quote scripture. He quoted 24 books of the Old Testament, almost 180 times in the New Testament. The following Christ program has required you to memorize scripture at each meeting. 
This is done because it is an important exercise in internalizing God's Word for the following reasons. Firstly, keeping the Word of God in our heart helps us when we are confronted with temptation, thus making it easier to avoid sinful behavior. Second, all believers should have a ready defense of their faith. 1 Peter 3 verse 15. Shall we read that? Who would like to read that for me? I'll read it. Is Peter in the Old Testament? One Peter three fifteen, <laughs> and I will resolve it. To do so effectively requires that we memorize Scripture, speaking God's word instead of our own. We give our message more authority and harness the power that is in the Word of God. And uh, all those Scriptures are available to you. But let's see what One Peter three fifteen. Do not fear them or be intimidated, but in your heart. Regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. So I have a question. Like, I get people ask that to memorize scripture, do they need to memorize the like, verse, chapter, so, so? Or just memorize the words. Well, I think that it hel- it's helpful to memorize where it comes from. The reason being, you can start sounding like a Bible basher, and the person who you're talking to may want to check it out. And actually, we should. We should check it out when people start quoting scriptures to us. We should actually go and check it out and say, well, I wonder if that was exactly what was meant. I, you know, we, we've been at commanders to check it out and to test what is said to us. So now that, that you quote is in Acts 17. Thanks. I think the important thing just to add there, uh, Didier, is there's a lot of people out there who say the Bible says, but actually the Bible doesn't say it anywhere because they've sort of got it passed down. So you get a lot of error coming in when people just say the Bible says, or it says somewhere that but they don't know where. So, just like in a legal defense, you have to be able to quote what your source is. And you know the reference means that likely where it says you can go and look it up. And there was a testimony I heard of a, a, a lesbian lady who came to Christ, and she said that they would see all these people in placards, and they had Lev, I don't know what the reference is, but it's from Leviticus. They didn't know what it meant. But eventually, that thing came to them, and they went and found the scripture and read it there, and it convicted them. But if, it, if the reference wasn't there, they would never have actually been able to know where did it say this thing that they were saying. Can I quickly ask something? <coughs> um, so the Jehovah's Witness, they have a certain way of saying the Bible. Mm-hmm. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Do they have their own translation, or do they use NLP? Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, they have their own Jehovah's Witness have their version of our Bible. Just as I read from the Catholic, they have corrupted scriptures within it to meet their uh, doctrine. They've claimed that the people that started it uh, had an understanding of Hebrew, etc., etc. Where the Mormons uh, were given it by the Moroni, the angel, etc. So, again, on the different cult. Sorry, Remember that uh, the devil wants to corrupt the Bible. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, that's what he wants. <coughs> and so I guess we're going to get more and more versions and more and more changes and more and more slightly changing things in the Bible, and we need to be on our guard. And so knowing Scripture also helps with that, you know. And yeah, but a, a, cur- a current um, okay. thinking is that uh, all these top preachers are making their own Bibles, yeah. Yeah. their own commentary. So I'm not saying that's wrong, but I'm just saying be aware. You know. Can I ask something? I heard my sister bought the Joyce Meyer Bible for women, and I immediately felt um, convicted and told her she must go and research this because I didn't feel right. Somebody knows about this. No, I wouldn't. Uh, Joyce Meyer is a prosperity theology yeah. preacher, so uh, her interpretation of scripture would yeah. be walked in favor of her doctrine. Thanks. 
Okay, let's move along. So we are the third bullet point, which says God speaks to us through his word. And the more scriptures that you read and memorize, the more the Holy Spirit can bring them to mind. This is especially true when you are coping with the stresses of daily life. Getting back to you, Jimmy, you know, it's not wrong to, to have these scriptures that, that God has spoken to you in a way and you know what they are, but you don't quite know where they are, but it's, that they can be there to encourage you. But if you are wanting to have a defense for the gospel, it is a good idea to learn the scripture reference as well. Uh, so, so, coming to that, uh, I don't know if it's... Because then it comes to the question, like, um, what if people have a like, uh, reading plan? How do you, I don't know if it's in the, in the world, how do you do it? Like, can you start from Genesis to Revelation, or you can pick up a book? Like, from, uh, Remember that the Bible is all those different things. It's poetry, it's a narrative, and, and honestly, there are many, many good ways to do it. I like a reading program that says, you can read the Bible in a certain amount of time, and it's wonderful to read a book at a time. But there are also, for example, you can go and read a particular narrative and learn something from that. You can go and learn, read um, some of the letters of Paul and learn what he was saying to the new church. You know, so you don't have to read it from cover to cover. It certainly isn't written in order of um, how things happen. So you, you know, there are many ways that you can do it, and sometimes change the way you always do it is a good idea. Yeah, Paul in Acts 20 said, I've preached the whole counsel of God to you. And that's from Genesis to Revelation. So my, my suggestion is try and read the Bible in a year, but have a mix every day from the Old Testament, Psalms, Proverbs, and New Testament. And I've been doing that for years, and it's very healthy because you see perspective in the thing. But if the Holy Spirit leads you to do something else, you know, we mustn't be caught in, in, in routine. We must be led by the Spirit. And then, um, last bullet point, memorizing Scripture gives us a better understanding of God and His Word. When we know God's Word and obey it, we can experience God at a deeper level and experience the freedom that comes only through obedience. John 8, 31, remember that was one of our our memory verses, speaking about abiding in me and allowing my words to abide in me. The more deeply we know God, and the more deeply we know His word, God. Um, scripture continues to say, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And you know what's amazing, guys? I just want to say this. When Jesus was walking along the road with these two men who were going to Emmaus, what did Jesus say to them? God? He expounded scripture to them. And he, uh, he, he explained scripture. And the only scripture that he had at the time to, to, to tell them about was the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But what happened is the, the feeling that there's something about this man burns in their heart. And that's how we need to be with scripture. We need to take this word and let it burn in our hearts. Mm -hmm. And let, it, let God reveal and allow the Holy Spirit to reveal something to you so that you can change your life. And it's, it's the most miraculous book that has ever existed. It's the best seller. Yes. yes. Oh. So practically, it is a good idea to set aside time to read your Bible every day. Yeah, it says the quiet time in the word of comments, because maybe it's not so quiet. Okay? Maybe it's not so quiet. But the point is that to set aside a time away from your everyday hustle and bustle, it's keep up a good habit of memorizing scripture and storing God's word in your heart. You know, a fun time and a fun place to be with other people. When you do in a Bible study together, like we're doing today, where we, we all are encouraged to memorize scripture. It's, it's something that is incredibly wonderful. And when you've done it and you have it in your heart, it's there. And we have the pro proclamation which 
I will read and I, I pray that, that you will pray this in your heart. I declare that I will treasure the words of the Lord. I am mindful that God's word is manufactured and and is therefore a lamp to my feet and a light to my heart. I am committed to daily spending time reading the Bible and to work in the Bible scripture. God, can you say that with me today? Amen. Can we say it together? Amen. Okay, let's say it together. I declare that I will treasure the word of the Lord. I am mindful that God's word is a manufactured handbook and is therefore a lamp to my feet and a light to my soul. I am committed to spending time reading the Bible and to work on memorizing scripture. Thank you, folks. Thank you, Neil, the winner. Let's pray. Lord, this is such a precious gift. Your word. Thank you for it. Lord, it leads all of us, your children, out of darkness into your glorious light. We are all grateful, Lord, for this firm foundation in which we are now able to stand, being able to discern between truth and the deceptions of the evil one. Thank you also, Lord, that your word draws us into a deeper relationship with you, our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are able to commit our lives into your loving hand. Thank you, Father. Amen. 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 Have a great Amen. week, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. Thank you so much.